More on our top headline story, money laundering. We have with us Mr. Athria, financial services partner at consulting firm Mazars. And on Zoom, we have Radesh Singh, ASEAN financial services risk management leader for EY. Welcome, both of you. Let's start with a question to both of you, but Ms. Singh can take it first. Uh, money laundering occurs... Let's, t- let's take a look here. Uh, why is it so difficult to detect money laundering, even with today's very stringent rules? Well, I'll, I'll go ahead and take that question. Thank, thank you for having me here tonight. Well, it, it is difficult simply because we're looking at um, a huge amount of, a huge volume of transactions often, as as well as, um, you know, multiple level of controls that are there to financial institutions required to put in place and obviously ensure that all of them are effective and work efficiently. Now, although we use technology today in doing um, all these uh, activities that we talked about in terms of monitoring and surveillance, it still make it, it, it still does make it difficult, especially when we do have, when we have of, um, people who have planned the activity to infiltrate the system, it gets that much harder to pick up uh, a transaction that's anomalous among many, many other transactions which are uh, above board. So that's one of the key challenges, I would say. I think to add to what Radha said, right, um, rules are the f- first part of the equation. So just by themselves, they can't help. From where I see, I see broadly two challenges. One, Rajesh did mention, it's the data aspect of things mm-hmm. where the vast amount of data does take a considerable time and effort to analyze and essentially find the needle in the haystack. Second aspect uh, that I see is the challenge is the sophistication with which uh, these money launderers are operating. Because it's an evolving risk, they're also constantly evolving with their mm-hmm. techniques. Um, so they are actually exploiting the complex nature of cross-border transactions and also essentially taking advantage of the varying regulations between different countries, yeah. jurisdictions. Apart from that, they're also aware of the data sharing limitations that we have. So that's how they hide the beneficial ownership and also structure their transactions similarly uh, to essentially launder money. So that becomes really difficult. If I could stay with you, Mr. Athreya, um, let's look at money laundering in the digital space uh, as uh, an example. Mm-hmm. Um, we just heard Ms. Singh say that um, the, the money launderers actually customize uh, their tactics to deal with specific technology out there and to overcome it as, as, as you would. Um, so is there any kind of technology out there that is available to at least help reduce the time it takes to even detect these uh, such crimes? Yes, I mean, uh, technology is evolving. Mm -hmm. Um, Emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and blockchain have given us a considerable advantage. We're using these technologies for pattern matching, machine learning, cognitive intelligence, Mm -hmm. big data analytics. All these are essentially uh, where we can use them for analyzing vast amount of data, identifying essentially where the actual bad actors are, what the suspicious transaction is, and then also identifying who these money launderers are at the back end. So we are using technologies, reducing the manual effort that takes place and ensuring that the vast amount of data is actually churned through to to identify eventually. Yeah, there is hope. Our detection is one part of it. Ms. Singh, is it possible for any company to inadvertently commit money laundering without actively, proactively wanting to be doing that? Well, I'd say not committing money laundering in this case, right? If you're looking at financial institutions, then the issue always is about first in, inadvertently facilitating, right? Without knowing that there are perpetrators out there that are trying to uh, obviously, um, you know, obfuscate their, their uh, identity or you know their uh, bad intent or the illicit funds that they are trying to launder through the system. So that can happen. But I do think that with the technology that we have in place today, the artificial intelligence, Mr. Tia talked about that, as well as network link uh, analytics, et cetera, and so on and so forth, there are um, 
you know, there are obviously much, many more opportunities today to eventually detect uh, the the anomalous activity. It does take some time, but uh, it can be eventually detected. But the issue always also is the fact that a particular financial institution is only looking at its own data. Um, the, the, the limitation here is that uh, one financial institution will not be able to see what's going, uh, what's happening across the system. If, 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 if that's, you know, an easier way to explain it. Mm. Well, uh, Mr. Threya, uh, there is a new platform, though, that banks uh, will be employing to tackle money laundering more. Uh, is this the answer, perhaps? Uh, and, and what does this platform need to be and do to be effective? Definitely. This is actually a step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. uh, the platform is called Cosmic, mm -hmm. uh, Collaborate, of information for money laundering and terrorist financing sharing across for cases. So this platform is actually starting as a pilot phase with six local banks here, um, where the information will be shared across these banks mm -hmm. and any suspicions, uh, issues or transactions would be reported. And uh, just now what Radish was talking about, yeah. The, the different financial institutions will then have access to this information and be able to collaboratively fight against s such financial crime. All right, a final question to Ms. Singh. Uh, tech regulations, but ultimately, could lawyers and accountants themselves contribute to this fight against money laundering? And, and absolutely, yes, they, they, they do contribute and they will continue to contribute. I do think that with each case like this that emerge, we learn more and we have more insights in terms of what we need to do as a, as a community, as an ecosystem. Clearly, the DNFBP sector that you're talking about, where the lawyers, accountants and you know the non-financial institutions fall under, there already are uh, requirements, regulations in place in Singapore today because we are a fair to have compliant country. Uh, could we do more? Yes, certainly. I I think with the, the current um, uh, scam that we're seeing in Singapore, there will be new learnings, new insights on how we can do this uh, better, obviously. Thank you both for joining us this evening. Radesh Singh from EY and Athreya, Mr. Athreya from consulting firm Mazars.